There's no vamos today. No vamos. I'm no sure. vamos. I'm actually, this, I'm vamos. Disappointed. No vamos. What's my, let's vamos. That's how George says. What's, what's George, Mike? George say vamos. If 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 I feel like uh, I feel like yours is the pods is there and there, and then you've got your papisms yeah. and touch balls. We yeah. would say, what do you mean by that? But you've stopped saying it for some reason. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my favorite one is when George goes, "I'm going to ask you a question," and then and then doesn't, <laughs> and then he goes on the street like a five minute monologue. And I was like, "What was the question? What was the question?" Let, let, let me throw it okay. back to you guys. That's your one. That's your one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast, and this one is a special one because things are changing at the Canon Podcast. No, none of us are leaving. We all still here. Contracts have been signed, uh, and we are here on long term, uh, long term, long ex- extension. But Alex, talk to the audience. What is changing going into the future? We've got some changes and it's up to me to read them because Babs didn't want to learn it. So essentially, um, there's going to be now a full hour available on a Monday, every single Monday. Every single Monday for free to everyone. And specifically, if you haven't uh, already signed up on uh, Spotify or Apple to the Canon Podcast, please do that because we're posting full episodes on there as well as the Instant Reaction. Nothing's changing on there. Uh, But that means we now have a fully exclusive... Uh, podcast midweek for uh, for patrons on the Canon Podcast Patreon and for YouTube members on the Canon Podcast as well, as well as a monthly special. We we do treat you. We do treat you <laughs> the Canon Podcast. Uh, a monthly special uh, available on the second part of a tactical A to Z is coming out uh, probably tomorrow for me and George. Uh, so we'll be doing that. Uh, yeah, to essentially to get more free content out there to people as well as getting more exclusive content out there for our patrons and our YouTube members who we really support, uh, who support us very well. And we thank you so much for so it. So in simple so terms, Back more to you in content. the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, more, more free content, more exclusive content. <laughs> TLDR. More. Yeah, and that also means on Thursdays there will still be uploads. So for the guys that still have free content, there will be videos as well. There will be. So lads... Let's let's get into this because we've got a lot to break down. Specifically, though, the Champions League, Arsenal's quarterfinal or semi-final quarterfinal. I miss quarterfinal I miss has the Europa been booked. Music. No, no, you don't. No, that's, that's just no. That's just I miss it. Do you not hear? Do you not hear the fans when they shout Champions in the, right. in the Emirates? Hot take. You like the anthem? The Europa that. League. The Europa League song is better. <laughs> no, no, no. I just. The, the Champions, I, it's not a bad the Champions song. League it's not a bad song, song is more iconic and is like and is more kind of you know it gives you more the feels in terms of a song. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, oh, okay, G- great, oh, oh. great. But you know my memories of that song is right because we always get knocked out basically in that competition. So the last yeah. memory of that song every year is just the, the end credits of the show yeah, I'm watching yeah, yeah, yeah. on BT, and it's like <laughs> I'm like, oh, not again. Every yes. year, I hear this song at this point. I don't hear it when we're lifting it, you know? KG so, nil nil the way to Carabag or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, Arsenal have been knocked out of Europe. Yeah. So, so no, we're not, we're not doing that. But like, if you want to listen to the European League anthem, go over to, to Merseyside, to Liverpool and, and listen to it, listen to it there. Cause we are in the Champions League quarterfinals. All that. Dilly ding, dilly dong. First, first time. And, since you know, we've got a game. Wow. Um, yeah. There's... Exactly. And we've got a game. Big, big game. And we've got Bayern München, Bayern Munich. So let's let's talk Bayern, right? Now, first things first, Alex, I'll go to you here because you did say, if I'm right in saying, that Bayern was the tie you wanted. <laughs> I did say that. I did say that. So here's the thing. We started out friends. Um, I think, name the song? No, okay. Nope. I think with Bayern and with Real Madrid and all these clubs, what happens is we say the name and we say things like, I feel confident I go up against Bayern or Real Madrid. And you hear that phrase and you go, that is mental. That is a crazy thing to say because you think of all the history, you think of the team, you think of the, how many times they won it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually break it down and start doing sort of 1v1s, I think I begin to start to go, we have got a seriously, seriously good chance here. 1v1, two call the Arteta. That's at least a debate. That is at least a debate. Go through the team. Uh, Sane v Saka, at least a debate. I would say Saka's better. Um, would you go let's go you know who they've got Pavlovic in the midfield Pavlovic whatever his name is at the minute Declan Rice is better uh, they've got Eric Dyer at centre back at the moment Gabriel and Saliba are better so that as you go through the team 1v1v1v1 1v1, 1v1, yes you hear the name you hear the lot you know you think about the Champions League nights and you think about that 10-2 aggregate whatever it's that sort of stuff but headline big picture and why I was interested in Bayern is because they are a massive team who would mean that we sort of come away from it and go, we've beaten a big European giant that we no doubts about if we could beat them, whether we had beaten a European giant. But they're also a team that I look at and feel really 
fairly confident that we can get a result against, especially because our uh, away fans are, are, are banned from the Emirates. That, I think it's a massive thing and a massive factor. Um, and yeah, I look through and I sort of do it kind of head to head, uh, and which is why I wanted Bayern in the first place. And I think there is a lot of potential matchups that we can win there. Massive, massive. And you're right. Bayern are almost a different side to the team that beat us at the Emirates the last time we were here. I mean, I'll go for that team, by the way, because it has changed quite a lot. <laughs> You've got Alaba in defence. You've got Javi Martinez was still there. Matt, Matt Hummels as well. Hola. The midfield was Arturo Vidal. And can you guess other midfielder, by the way? Schweinsteiger, maybe? Xavi Alonso. Wow. Xavi Alonso. Wow. Xavi Alonso. And in front of them, they had well, Bayern would do uh, for Thiago a, Alcantara. Uh, for an Alonso reunion now. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> Exactly. And and they had Frank Ribery on the left. Uh, and then what on the player. right, they had Iron Robin. So when you deal these you got, players. Have you got our team, Babs? Well, I got like, both lineups. And then up front, they had Robert Lewandowski. So that team there, by the way, let's just not forget that game, the context behind it. We were 5 1 down from the first leg. We opened this leg in, I think, pretty decent fashion. We were pretty good in the first half. Made it 1 0, could have made it 2 3. And then got a red card, started the second half. Because you only get sent off. And then obviously against 10 men, Bayern went rampant. Our team, David Ospina and goal. Back four, Hector Bayerin, Mustafi, Koscielny and Monreal. Midfield three, Oxlade-Chamberlain as a six, by the way. This is what I never understood. Ox is a six and then you had Xhaka is the eight with Ramsey in front of that as well. Unless it was a pivot. I, I, honestly, confusing as hell. And then the front three was Theo Walcott who scored, Giroud and Alex Sanchez. Mesut Ozil was sat on the bench. Right. Some good players there. Some good players. But if you go through head to head... We're getting way more. You know, than that you know what it is, guys. It it is, I've had this argument quite a while on Arsenal, and it's been defending their credentials this season because a lot of people are doing the same thing that they're doing with the Champions League that they've done with Arsenal this season in terms of putting the past onto this current Arsenal team. Yeah, and completely. and you know, I I think that when you have a look at things in general, I really agree with your point, Alex. About we needed a European giant. I didn't want um, you know an easier team because it. It's also experience for these boys. I'll be honest with you. Most people coming into this season all said the minimum expectation in the Champions League is the quarterfinals. We've achieved it. We have achieved what most people set out to do in the Champions League. So from an expectation point, I don't think there's anything more. Anything that we do from now on is icing on the cake. Now, I didn't personally believe that the quarterfinal was the minimum bar. I still felt that we needed to go to the semis, and I still do. And I'm still confident of it, by the way. But I think in terms of the type of teams that you're willing to beat and the manner in which we overcame our struggles against Porto, finally getting a knockout win at home. It wasn't just a tie that we somehow went to penalties in terms of aggregate. We won that game. People forget. Maybe not in the manner people wanted to, but we won that game. We destroyed that voodoo. And I think that the way that we won on penalties, there's always a kickstart. Football is emotion. And... I think, you know, there are times when podcasts, myself included, that we don't give it the value it deserves. And players themselves, they don't look at the specific formations. And and, and I'll be honest, they all look at the players that they're going to line up across and they're saying, can I take you? And it's it's an emotional feeling. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I look, for example, at Ben White. You know, I'm sure we're going to talk about him a little bit later, but him against Marcus Rashford. Why is that such a difficult matchup consistently? I've seen him go 1v1 against very speedy left wings and lock them down quite well. I think he does pretty well against Matoma. But Rashford, there's just something about him that really affects Ben White. And I think that there's some teams that really affect Arsenal. And to get it back to the point, that 8-2, we have history with Bayern. We have quite a bit of history with Bayern. And I think... 10-2, 10 to, was it? Well, on aggregate. But <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's a team that I feel represents everything that a lot of Arsenal fans wanted to be. I look at that Yup Heikness team as something that I think Mikel draws a lot of inspiration from, much more than other managers, by the way, in terms of the makeup, in terms of how we make this team become physical. I like this Bayern matchup because it's a team that definitely historically created a lot more prominence, has the name but has fallen in recent times. And yeah. Mikel's record against Thomas Tuchel is pretty incredible. It's very good, actually. And I think there's a lot of narrative in terms of them missing out on Declan Rice and that whole story that, 
that whole narrative, which is what these knights are built off. Make no mistake about it. The bookmakers and the fans, we love this crap. Do you think the players care that Declan Rice came to Arsenal and they didn't go to Bayern? But that's going to be a story in the pre-match buildup. You know, the Thomas Tuchel effect in terms of how he's going to spite his England woes. And he's going to come back looking for a dagger. And, you know, we build up these storylines. But, mate, players do too. And, you know, I love referencing this documentary. I've done it on this podcast so many times. But the Michael Jordan documentary, I look at an elite player like that and what he had to do to get himself up to playing for games. And do you guys remember there was a point in that documentary that he basically makes up a lie about one of these yeah. opposition yeah. players? Right now, so I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's in order to get himself up for the game. And I just feel like this is what winners do. They try to change the standards so that they can rise to them. And when I look at this Bayern team, I agree with you guys. There's a quality gap. I will say they're a tougher team than, in my opinion, that people think. I would have preferred a Barcelona because I feel like they're similar in terms of having a big name, having history and prestige. But they're a team that I don't think can run with us. This Bayern team, to a lesser extent, can run with us. And that's going to be the question mark here. They still have a a very potent wing pairing. I look at Kingsley Coleman, if he can stay fit. That's a player that I seriously look at. And uh, Jamal Musiela, if we're going to have success in this tie, those are two players that I really feel like are going to decide what Bayern are able to do. And from an Arsenal perspective, I'm looking at Gabriel Martinelli attacking their right-hand side of Upamecano, Kimmich potentially at right back. That right-hand side is something that I feel we can get at. Um... And I think as as a whole, if we're going to be successful, we've got to press their buildup. Bayern's biggest struggles this season have actually been in buildup. If we let them run with Alfonso Davies and give him space to run, he's going to hurt you. Like these are physical players. They can make up the ground. And we saw the effect of a physical team against this Arsenal team. And I really feel that's the only way to step to them. So from a Bayern perspective, They're looking to create transitions and they're looking to make it a Bundesliga game. And from an Arsenal perspective, we're looking to do much of what we've done all season. Camp in their half, make sure that we can control transitions, don't allow them any shots on target that are quality, and try to squeeze them in their own half using our own high press to create high turnovers. We can do that effectively, then I think that we make this tie light work. And I don't say that disrespectfully, but... That's mm-hmm. going to be the challenge for, I think, both teams to balance. It's weird because Bayern have changed quite a lot, but they've still got four players in their current team that was in the team against Arsenal in 2017. I think the four players are Muller, Neuer, Komen and Joshua Kimmich. Arsenal have completely changed. So, Alex, my question to you is, how do we approach this game tactically? Is it going to be Mikel imposing his style of play and trying to make a statement? Or is it being the Champions League, being at Bayern first as well, or being a Bayern second, more pragmatic? You know, how are we going to approach the game at the Emirates? Is it going to be we're going to go gong ho, get the goals, or is Mikel going to keep Arsenal in the game and hope that we can go to Bayern and get a result? I I think this might be a special case in terms of the the atmosphere that we could possibly create at the Emirates in, in that first leg um, without the Bayern fans. So I think there is definitely a, an impetus and we know Mikel uses the crowd. He constantly talks about the crowd, so that, that I'm sure it'll be part of his thinking. I think, um, yeah, sort of building on what George said, look, Bayern will be interested in transitions. They'll be interested in trying to, to break quickly. So I can't imagine we're going to see a game where Arsenal are sort of camped in Bayern's, or we're going we're gonna to try any kind of game, game, game type where we're camped in their half, we've got them, we've got the field tilt numbers that we all want, all that sort of stuff. I, I can't see that happening. Partly because I don't think Bayern would allow it, but I also don't think think Arteta would aim for that. I think Arteta will be keen... um, Well, I don't know what he'll think, but my my, my thoughts on what Arteta will think will be Arteta might be keen to let Bayern have the ball. Because it's similar to... If you you think back to the the Manchester United game, the, the way they can kill you, Man United, is on the transition. And what did we do? We let them have the ball. We said, look, you you play with it. We're going to sit 20 yards off you. And Ketty is going to be s- s- stood in the centre circle while Casemiro is stood between his centre-backs and let you have the ball. Because once you're there, I think they have some brilliant players. But it's quite a P&P team. Kind of always has been. Um, pace and power, not postage and packing. And it kind of always has been. And it still is a little bit. And I don't 
I'm not. I'm in no way saying that Kimmich and Goretzka and these guys can't build up. But what I'm saying is their best, best, best qualities, and the thing that I think I, I, I love to watch them do is kind of win those battles, win those duels, get the ball off quickly, arrive late in the box. Kimmich sort of keeping it tight. I don't see sort of eye of the needle players at the base of their midfield. So I don't worry about us stood there in a the mid block and by and breaking us down. I really don't. I, I, and I think we could we could really frustrate them. I also trust us in 1v1 situations with, you know, hopefully we'll have Tommy Asu, you know, fully fit and firing by that point. And I imagine Tommy Asu will play a big, big part in those uh, those two games. I think we have Timber back, hopefully, which, you know, m- maybe could can help us there as well. I don't worry about us isolating their wingers 1v1 and shutting them down. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not I'm not too worried about that. And then in terms of us on the ball, again, I feel fairly confident. I think I also feel we can use the transition against them. If they're trying to 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 use their superpower, let's say, against us, I think we can turn around and use it against them. And I and I, I back a sacker against an Alfonso Davies. Um, you know, not in a foot race, but you know, in a one v one scenario, I back that. So I think it's a number of places we could beat them. I, I think the overall approach to the game might be, as you say, Bav's a bit more pragmatic than maybe we're, 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 we're used to. But I think at the Emirates, we absolutely can go for it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a reason behind that as well. I think Mikel obviously have seen seen City last year and gone, look, City every year would play their style of football in the Champions League and it wouldn't get them to the final or wouldn't get them to win. So they managed to make, make him more pragmatic. I think I've got the stats here, but even last year against Bayern, in the first leg, City won 3-0, but Bayern had more possession. Mm. which never happens to City. And in the second leg, Bayern had even more possession and City obviously got a draw. So I, I reckon Mikel will try to be a bit more tactical in the games where he's trying to be a bit more pragmatic, adapt around the opposition, yeah. rather than go, okay, let's play our style of football because it's not the Premier League. What they are, uh, and maybe this is, this is again, saying they're all this is not true, but it, they're generally on a broad spectrum, a lot of them are big space players. And if we force them to, and, and again, where where are those big spaces in behind us? If we stop them having them, they can't have that kind of influence that they normally have in the Bundesliga. You know, Harry Kane being able to drop so deep and then link up, you know, and do... do what, when you go and watch, you ever see on, on Sky when the highlights come up and it's Bayern against like Darmstadt and they've just beaten them like 15-0 or something. Yeah. What you notice in those games, in my opinion anyway, is the, the amount of ground these players cover. Don't let them cover that ground because that's when they'll kill you. And I think if we do that, you know, as... as Pep clearly did last year. I think we, we have a good well, chance. Well, my fear is, guys, yeah, I, I think... We'll, we'll, I, go on, yeah, my, my one fear, and I'll, and I'll say this, is I, I do think that the, the high press turnover and build-up is going to be our best chance creation method. Because, I mean, people are looking at their at their back line and saying, like, I fancy us. But if you actually have a look at their back line, it's fairly solid. Um, because Dyer's coming in from an injury. And, you know, I think in general senses, you're going to look at Davies, um, you know, Kim and Jay, Lupa Meccano, these these are athletes, you know. Kimmich is probably somebody that you're looking at right Flicked. back in terms of inverting that you're going to be able to say, eh, I don't know about, I think I can get at him. But from, from a whole, these are big boy athletes as well. And the issue that I've got is I think Bayern are actually going to go long. I don't think Bayern are, they know that their buildup is poor. I, I, I look at Thomas Tuchel and I think he's going to try to very much employ much of the same Chelsea tactic that he tried to do on Boxing Day, that infamous Boxing Day that, you know, we did really well. And I think that he's going to look at this Arsenal side and say, there is no point in attempting to play in the middle of the park here. We're going to go long. We're looking to go and hit our outlets. And we're looking to hit the second balls and have our pivot be very aggressive to try to send Alfonso Davies on a run. And I think that even if you were to sit back and eliminate the space, one thing that they're going to be looking for, at least, is going to be that out ball out wide. And I think that they trust themselves to have a 1v1 against Alfonso Davies and against Ben White. And I think that's going to be a very key battle in this tie. How Ben White's able to deal with Alfonso Davies is going to be critical to stopping any of their final third chance creation. But I do think from an Arsenal perspective, if we're going to be able to stop Bayern from playing, I think it's going to be with us meeting them high, forcing build-up errors, and making sure that um, they don't get time to feel comfortable. Because the longer they run, the easier they'll feel in the tile because they have experience in doing it, not just against us, but also in the Champions League. And so I think I look at our players and I think that they are very naive in the setting. And doing the thing that makes them confident is what I would prefer in these types of games, as opposed to maybe pulling a Man United tactic, which this team has shown. It's a chameleon. It's perfectly viable. But I think for me, it's time to give them arrogance 
And I do think that, like you said, Alex, with the fact that we have our full fans at home, it sends a poorer message, in my opinion, to go pragmatic. There's a time to be pragmatic, and then there's a time to exert your influence. And in a tie, there's going to be that case home and away. For me, the bigger chance that you're going to feel supported to do that is going to be at home without their fans. And that's going to be the time to maximize your potential. So that's how I see it, at least. The only thing I'll say, though, is if you think about if we do go very gongo in the first in the first leg, as Alex says, you know, Bayern love spaces and there will be a lot of space in behind us. So I think that's where I just wonder how, how much respect Mikel shows in that first leg and how yeah. much does he want to win that or keep us in the, in the, in the tie. I, I do hear you, George, and I, and I, I don't necessarily disagree. I just think, I, I think Arte- <laughs> what, <laughs> the football analysis of the century, Arteta wants to win. <laughs> so I think whatever he, whatever way he thinks he, he, he can do that. It, what my point is that I don't think he'd think, well, uh, you know, may, maybe he sends the wrong message to the players, or whatever. I, I think he would probably err on the side. I'm not saying, you know, this is my opinion. I think he'd err on the side of look. Let's be a little bit more again. But what does pragmatic actually mean? Pragmatic, yeah. I suppose we we normally associate with being a little bit, you know, a little bit more direct, a little bit less sort of build up a little bit less constructing, you know, intricate interior play, all that sort of stuff. But actually, pragmatic is like let's try and win the game. Do you know <laughs> like, what, whatever do you know way what he sees? Me, I'm not saying I'm right, but I think I'm not. I'm not saying I'm right, but I do think Wait. I do whatever. I'm, my point is more that I don't think he'd be thinking in those terms, in my opinion. When I, when I hear pragmatic. I hear you guys mention United. I hear sitting off the ball, approaching more zonal approach to our press, as opposed to the 1v1 man press that has shot us up the table since Dubai. That's what I hear when I hear pragmatism, in a sense. And for me, when I say impetus, I mean meet them out of possession. Like our unique quality, if you were to describe Arsenal, their best quality is undoubtedly the press. We're brilliant at many things. But what makes Arsenal unique is our 1v1 man press ability. So what I'm trying to say is if I look at a weapon and what makes Bayern unique, for example, Bayern's uniqueness is probably a kind of a kind of je ne sais quoi in the final third, an ability to have Jamal Musiela and Alfonso Davies combine for a bit of magic. That is there. They're a little bit more individualism. Arsenal's is a collective. Arsenal is Every single player is going to meet you high up the pitch and squeeze, and you're not going to find any joy. And there's going to be an inevitability to a touch regain model. What do I mean by that? I know that hasn't happened in a while. It's this idea that, you know, with the high press, okay, you're forcing turnovers. And, you know, this idea that no one feels comfortable in terms of exerting any influence, building a calmness on the ball, because you're constantly causing a touch regain um, with the opposition. So for me, that's what I look at. And I, and I think that if you're going to send that message to your players to sit off and approach more of a zonal effect, I think it plays more into the fear aspect of a young Arsenal team that right now they need to feel boastful. Like I look at the times that I felt Arsenal haven't been good this season. Their press hasn't been good. The times that we've lost really poorly, I look at Fulham, I look at some of our West Ham performances, I think even the Chelsea performance, by the way, earlier in the season, all of those performances have a very similar thing. We weren't intense off off the ball. Uh, if we can be as binary as you know, going man for man and 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 you know, doing what has got us where we are, and being as kind of more zonal and more Man United e, which I don't think is is necessarily fair. I hear you, and I think there is definitely value in saying let's go for this this game model because it has got us where we are. But my point is is that I don't think we should make that decision based on the idea that we, should, we want to send the right message to the players. We want to. I think it should be based on what the game requires. And I think Mikel will be basing his, his, his decision on that based on the game. And that said, the game I expect, which I appreciate is very different <laughs> from what Mikel will be thinking, is, is leaning towards the more, if we're going to be binary, the United approach, especially away from home. But uh, at home, I think 100% there's, there's, there's scope for the first, first approach. Massive, massive. And, and here's what I'll say is, look, we talk about, you know, that, that game against Bayern in 2017. The biggest change for Arsenal is the defence and the fact that we have the best defence in the Champions League and the Premier League. So I, I wonder what the feel around Bayern is going to be coming to Arsenal, saying what Arsenal is this now? Is it different? How different is it? Because our numbers are like Atletico. 
they like Inter Milan in terms of that, you know, we can style for you. Like Porto, I think Porto were the set of team just after Arsenal in terms of XG against. So that's why I feel like, you know, I'm confident going into this tie that we're not going to get blitzed like we did all those years ago. Because that was a feeling I remember after that 5-1, back-to-back 5-1s is helplessness. We can't defend. No matter what we do, we just can't defend these guys. Whereas now I'm like, okay, bring it on. I want to see how we cope against Musiala, Harry Kane as well. And if we can avoid a penalty. There's been a lot of reaction from the Bayern side. Um, just to just to read out a couple. So this is from their CEO. It's going to be a difficult road. Arsenal are in top form as Premier League leaders. It's going to be an even contest. They're no longer the team who we won comfortably against in the last three games. Nevertheless, the, the target is clear. After three quarterfinal exits in a row, we're desperate to progress. This is too cool. We certainly have the most difficult path ahead of us that you can imagine. Manuel Neuer says they're a very strong team with a good spirit. Muller says Arsenal are a team will give us two thrilling games. There's a lot of reaction. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but a lot of buying. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is special to Arsenal, but I'm saying that there, there was a lot that came out from Bayern. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, they, they will feel it is historical. And of course, it plays a part. But that team that played them in 2017 doesn't exist anymore for Arsenal. The players have all changed and the managers changed as well. So I wonder how, I'm, I'm excited to see how we cope, for sure. And um, I want to ask you guys a simple question now. Seeing now the quarterfinals and potentially the semi-final draw for Arsenal, if we were to get past Bayern, could be City or Real. What, are you, what do you guys think is our, our chances of actually doing something and maybe even getting to Wembley? We'll go to George first. <laughs> I think Go this, for the positive or first. <laughs> no, I, I, I think Arsenal always have the ability to do something. But um, I look at that schedule and it's a tough schedule. Um, I, <laughs> I hate to be the boring answer. As far as I'm concerned, when you've got a big assignment, I look at completing the task at hand. Let's, let's get through Bayern first. Um, and then we will approach, if we are able to proceed, We'll approach there because I think that once you get to the semi, get off the fence. Okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> well, All right. let me let me change it. Okay, cool. Let's just say we get past Bayern. Who would you prefer, Real or City? Real Madrid over City, absolutely. Ooh. I think when you when you're competing with somebody already for the league, it adds more jeopardy in there. Um, and I do think that City are the more complete team right now as well, broadly speaking. Um, but it, it's even more so if if you're going to compete against these same people in a domestic sense, then facing them as well in the Champions League adds a bit more jeopardy to it. So, um, yeah, and I, and I think that it would affect them more, personally. So I would definitely rather Madrid. Alex, go on. I need the answer. I need to, I need to hear, Babs, we're getting to Wembley, believe. You know, Babs, I think we just need to go one game at a time. I'm oh, really... Uh, <laughs> right, we're on to the next topic. <laughs> Look, I, very quickly... I yeah we do need to, we do need to take it one game at a time. I would prefer Real Madrid. I'm not very confident. Sorry everyone about us getting to the final. Um, I think Bayern will beat us over two legs. But wait wait hold on hold on hold know. on. This is a this is a more interesting question. Wait, you think that we don't survive the Bayern tie? Like, I think Bayern beat us over two legs. Not because they're a better team than us, but I think because. As I've said, there's four of them who've done this year in, year out. I looked at those against Porto and I thought, we are a brilliant team who are playing within ourselves because of the occasion. That is what I felt. I could be wrong, but that is what I felt. And I think away at the Allianz, I'm not saying we'll SH1T our pants, but I, I do think the Champions League is such it's such a different beast. I do think in the Premier League, generally the best team wins. But how many times have we seen in the Champions League that the best team doesn't win? It's 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 more about how you handle the occasions and how you handle the the high high volume and high high margin moments. I could be wrong. I would love to be wrong, but I just think we need a couple more years' experience in the same way City mm-hmm. did before we go and win it. It's funny because I actually feel like the first leg for this uh, for us in this game is a bit more scary than the second, even though the first is at home. Because I feel like home's a lot more pressure away from home. I think I, we can do something there. So look, of course, the goal is to get to Wembley. And another place where, you know, you've got Wembley as a destination is the FA Cup, where Eric Ten Hag beat Jurgen Klopp. This guy. Uh, and Somebody listen, will. Eric Ten Hag beat Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> and, and it was a last minute scenes at Old Trafford as, as they got to the semifinals of the FA Cup. Now, we don't really care about that too much, but there was quotes after the game from Eric, where your team just made it into the semifinals of the FA Cup. You've got Coventry, a team that you should be beating with all due respect, right? And you've beaten Liverpool, your biggest arch rivals. And you somehow find a way to mention Arsenal. <laughs> Alex, talk to me. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to discuss this because uh, it, communication as a manager is so, so important. And, and let's just tackle the Ten Hag thing first. I've always felt that 
It's not even, it's not his English. And I, I want to be very, very clear that I'm not in any way criticized. I can't, I can speak about a couple of words in Spanish and a few Italian words. I really can't speak any other language. And I have real respect for anyone who can, who can put things across. But there is a way of communicating in another language with a sense of force and a sense of purpose without it being perfect. And I think someone at the club, generally with Ten Hag, needs to have a look at his communication. And it makes me realise how lucky we are with Arteta, which I'll come on to. But someone at United really does need to have a word with Ten Hag and say, look, mate, like I, I know what you're saying. I, I know what you mean about the Arsenal thing. It just makes you look so weak. It makes you look so bitter. And it's you, you, you might be correct, but it's the emotional intelligence that he doesn't seem to have com when we compare him with Arteta to understand that that's not what the United fans need to hear. Say that behind closed doors. That's fine. Say that to your players. Say it to whoever. But when you're facing the media, there's so many eyeballs on you. There's so many people. And it, all it takes is, again, it, it doesn't require his English to get any better. And I, and I, I don't want to stress this too much, but I want to be clear. I'm not criticizing that because fair play to him. It's about his, it's, it's kind of the imperceivable stuff, the aura, the kind of the, the the belief in what he's saying everything he says and i and i look at him and i and i do look at pochettino whatever that there are other managers that you look at the basically the ones who aren't in the title race and i do look at them and i go do i believe you when you communicate do i do i want to follow you do i do i look at you and i go yeah you you really have that courage of your convictions it feels kind of head, a lot of hedged bets, a lot of things where I look at them and it kind of, you know, Pochettino, I think a couple of weeks ago, talked about how the players were tired or something. It's like, mate, like, come on. You might be right. You might be right. But that's not what they need now. And I want to bring it on to Arteta because I think we kind of, I do think we underrate Arteta's communication skills, not only in terms of the, the, the multiple languages he speaks or whatever, but the fact that when he does speak, how much you believe him, how much you want to follow him, how much you believe he at least believes what he is saying. Again, I think it's the authenticity. You, 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 you can disagree with someone, you can agree with someone, you can whatever, but there is a sense and everyone knows it when you hear someone, you think that, that they're not being authentic. They're not saying exactly what they think. Everyone just knows it. You feel it in, in yourself. You just, I just know you're not being truthful. I might not agree with you. I might not know, you know, think you're right, but I, I do believe you believe what you're saying. And if you look at how Pep communicates and Klopp and Arteta communicates, there is a massive element of communication that, that I think he's kind of missed out of the Arteta analysis a lot of times. I've done a video on this. The emotional intelligence that he has to understand what every situation needs, that is massively underrated for Arteta. And we saw it with Ten Hag there. That is not what that situation needs. You've just won. Your fans want to hear a rousing sense, you know, here's where we're going, get this, you know, what can we do with this? Can we build on this? Can we move on this? And you look at a number of incidents from Arteta, you know, I was speaking about in the video, post Liverpool, when we beat them at home, peak Liverpool, the my chest is here, guys, all that, all that stuff. We have a very special, not only tactician and manager, but communicator here. And I think sometimes it takes you to look at other managers to realise what you have at home. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. The quote he said of course, Ten Hag said, after the game, at Arsenal, the fourth game of the season, we should have had a penalty in the 87th minute. We scored a goal that was disallowed. Then we conceded a goal that should have been disallowed. I'm not quite sure why our goal should have been disallowed. I don't know if there's any logic behind Just that. Wrong, but of course, yeah. it was a lot of moaning. Now, George, Tanag wasn't the only guy to make headlines as a manager after the game. You also had Klopp, mm -hmm. who mentioned that the report asking the question was unfit to ask the question. Now, I think... He's not body shaming the person. I think that's been confirmed after because the person actually wasn't, he was in decent shape. But I think he was asking more as, as a, as a reporter, right? I don't think he's got a six pack, but yeah, I don't think he was out of shape like that. So what, what do you make of Jurgen Klopp's, I guess, distaste after the game where we often see it with Klopp, where if he doesn't get what he wants, the Klopp crybaby starts again. It's a tantrum. It's a child tantrum. That's what it is. Yes. And it's, um, uh, I'm going to go far. I, I don't, I don't value that as a man, really, as a winner. I find that, you know, it's difficult in the moment. I'm, I'm not going to say that, you know, I'm a void of this. You know, I, I definitely have my moments where I act out as well. But, you know, you are the manager of a huge global brand. Okay? You're leaving. You've announced you're leaving. And you're going to have to make sure that you act in a way that produces class for that football club. Because you don't just represent yourself. You represent the boys that you're managing. And you also represent the entire fan base. And 
and how you react to people and how you perceive yourself in a leadership role, it looks bad on the entire brand as, as a whole. And look, maybe maybe this is who Liverpool are. They're emotional, right? Like as a club, no one can deny that emotion is probably a core crux of their philosophy for good or for bad. And so it has its bad. And this is its bad in terms of that. I, I, I just don't respect it. I look at a man in Arsene Wenger, who I grew up on, taught me everything, not just about football, but a lot about life as well. And that man was gracious in any kind of instant. He had his moments, um, but on the whole, you could trust Arsene Wenger to always say the right thing and to make sure that he had objectivity and to make sure that he had a level of emotional maturity to never insult. You know, I've, I've never, I've never understood when you have a disagreement, when another party starts to insult, you know you've won. <laughs> like you sit down, take a knee, and you let the clock run out because as soon as somebody starts doing that, you know you've hit a nerve and you know that the argument's lost. But what it looks like is just a manager that's not in control. And, you know, I, I, I don't I don't think that because of this interview, suddenly Liverpool are in a tailspin. You know, the title's ours, none, none of this stuff. But I just don't think that it's... Um, I hate the way that managers sometimes treat journalism because if we're going to raise standards in journal journalism we have to raise standards of manager as well there's got to be a level of honesty and there's got to be a level of dialogue that i think goes beyond the childhood playground of sarcastic smirking and insults like that's 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 not an adult thing to do yeah and, and this isn't the first time klopp's done it and again we're an arsenal podcast so we'll release it back to arteta but it's something arteta doesn't do and and he could do as well, by the way, he has ample opportunities to do. But it's it's that sort of, and I think I might have said it on the podcast before, and I will use the word, it is a kind of a slight abuse of power. That reporter's job, that reporter can't say anything to Jurgen Klopp. He can't go, excuse me, you can't say that to me. Or, you know, I'm not saying in this case, I don't know actually what happened, but he's done it before with other reporters. I remember there was a reporter, maybe for TNT, who asked him about an injury or maybe about the 12.30 kickoffs or something or something like that. There's been two or three incidents now that I've seen. There's another one in a press conference where the reporter is there. They actually, they have to remain professional because otherwise they, they lose their job. Klopp can get a bit shirty or whatever, and it's kind of fine because he's Klopp. It's like there, there is that kind of abuse of power. And when you become, as George was kind of saying, when you become rude and abrasive and whatever for no reason, rather than just saying no comment or rather than just whatever, you lose the element of control. You lose the element of, and Klopp is kind of, it started to happen in the last couple of years. I think probably in terms of, you know, it's not an excuse, but a reason. I think he's had some family issues and clearly he, he said himself he's, he's kind of zoned out and, and zapped by the job. But I think something again to, to kind of bring it back to Arteta I think he's maybe called out his players once with Pepe post leads. And I will say, actually, something I noticed. Arteta used to, in press conferences, sometimes the the, um, the the interviewer would be asking him a question and he'd cut off their last few words. I don't know if you guys noticed this before, but they'd be asking him a question. They'd say, da 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 and then he'd cut it off. And I realized, because I went back to watch some old interviews, he stopped doing it. And I think someone might have had a word with him. In the end, it's getting out of your own way it's getting out of, you know, your ego coming in and being a problem or whatever. It's going, I'm the manager, as George said, I'm the manager of a global brand. I'm not perfect, but when I get feedback from something, you know, and I, I would be surprised if he did the Desgracia thing again. Honestly, I, I would be surprised. I'm getting feedback from something. And, you know, what's, what's that Arteta phrase? You can always get better at life in it. I think what we're seeing from Arteta is an understanding and a, and a raising of the level of how he uses the media. Even how much more com com comfortable and confident he is around like the TNT guys, he seems a lot more. There's a there's an affability to him uh, on like I think he was on CBS as well, and he was kind of joking around with Arteta with um with Henri and stuff. There is a way you can do that to grow your profile as a manager, and I think it's something that goes massively underrated about Arteta is his is his communication and his use of the media that has got better, and he's not always been perfect, but has got better. Yeah, it definitely has. And uh, no, I, I found the Klopp interview fascinating. I thought their performance was even more fascinating because I saw what Liverpool are, where, where they're very good going forwards at times and they can be ruthless, they can make something out of nothing, but they're very vulnerable defensively. And so, George, having seen that Liverpool performance, and obviously we're fighting them for a title and they are below us as it stands on goal difference, 
what do you make of that in terms of the title race and maybe obviously them being out of the FA Cup might helping them but also in terms of again seeing that vulnerability of a United team that isn't good by the way opening them up time and time again and actually beating them with Anthony at left back and Bruno Fernandes at centre back I've always never understood why fans have watched Arsenal Unai Emery's Arsenal have quoted our uh, unsustainability at the beginning of the season and then felt because Liverpool have won a league, they will just get over that. It's always going to be a weakness in their game. I do think as the title race approaches five games, all of your faults, quote unquote, go out the window. I think that's the point where you kind of stop. If you're still looking at a kind of season that has almost 10 games of sample, like there, there is scope for, for this Liverpool team to be got at. There is. There just simply is. Their their final third ability and their prowess in the final third is what has got them over the line. Some might argue their ability in both boxes in general. I mean, Virgil van Dijk, Allison, these are all-time Premier League players in their position. Uh, you know, you've got Mohamed Salah, another all-time Premier League player in his position. So th- it's not that they're a bad team, but... I, I do think that they have a vulnerability in transition. I don't think that they control the middle of the park well. And I think that if you're going to be looking at predicting sustainability, the midfield is the engine room. It is what predicts whether or not you're going to have a successful game model. I just firmly believe that. And if you're a team that struggles in those things, I think that you're going to struggle more than a team that doesn't, just fundamentally. So I think on the balance, I do think that City will run us closer than Liverpool as challengers, but I don't think that they fall away massively and they're suddenly no longer part of the conversation. I I think that as soon as we get to five games, and if all three teams, which would be quite amazing, by the way, I don't know the last time that that's happened, that three teams with five games left are still in contention to win the league. If that happens, that for me is where I draw a bookmark and I start to say, okay, you know what? You can no longer talk about this season and who they were because it doesn't matter. There's a new story that begins with five games left and it's Who's got the balls? Who's got the balls to sit there and do it? Because mm-hmm. because you can you can comment on cojones. It becomes about cojones, right? Come help me out, mate. Like we better get him in for a pre-match prep, you know, uh, kind of uh, talk. <laughs> but um, I I do think that Liverpool will show it's their hand. And, and you know what, Babs, I'll, I'll do one thing and I'll throw it back to you guys. How do they respond? Oh, in in difficulty, <laughs> we we we've seen this team have faults, but I mean, this is the destruction of the quadruple. <laughs> you know the whole the whole narrative yeah, it, thing. It, it's funny how, how does that affect them I, I, look I, I reckon this has an impact now of course I've seen some Liverpool fans talk about you know the title win in 1920 and how they had a defeat to Atletico in the Champions League and this was similar to that I don't think it is personally I think just looking at their team right now I do see clear vulnerabilities defensively and even if it's with their fully fit back four they came to the Emirates with, with Van Dijk and Kanata and Alisson they still lost and they were you know pretty poor defensively they're not a good defensive side they're very good going forwards and I feel like it reminds me of us of, of, of Arsenal last year where we in the games we bottled the title let's just say Southampton, West Ham, Liverpool and games like that we scored the goals we just conceded too many and that was the issue. And I think that's why Mikel has gone defensively this year to, to help make sure that doesn't happen again. And Arsenal right now, the best defensive team in the league. And I, I'm pretty sure out of the last three, four, five winners, the team that has the least XG against and goals conceded normally wins the title because defences do actually help you win the title massively. So looking at Liverpool right now, uh, again, I just watched it yesterday and I was like, I, I see vulnerability. I do. And I, I appreciate they've had, they've had injuries as well. But do you think with Trent and defence, they're better defensively? They might be better, uh, better going forwards, but defensively they're not. So I, I, I look at them right now and I go, the next game for them are massive. They've got Brighton, I think, at home where we play City away. And if Liverpool, Liverpool are a type of team that I could, I could see dropping points in that type of game, like a Brighton or a game like that, because I feel like they've got the, the, the defensive vulnerabilities, whereas City, I don't. That's why I think it's very important for us to go to City and make something happen there. What do you think, Alex? They're, they're running very fine margins. And they're getting over the line very because, because they're Liverpool. But, you know, think about, you know, the, the game yesterday. And that's what I hate, though. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, Kyle. That's what no, I hate go, go. is when when Liverpool do that, they score a deflected goal from Harvey Elliott. I will hear other fans of other teams go, but that's Liverpool. Mm. I'm going, why? If we do that, if we score from corners, we get called out as being lucky. But then if they score a deflected goal, it's like Liverpool, Liverpool are amazing, and it's Klopp, and it's Salah, and it's all these guys. I'm, I'm like, at one point, you have to realize that there's a reason why they've won one title in the last five years. There's a reason why, because of this style of football. And the the one year they won a title, for example, the City had a bit of off year. Have they ever beaten City to a title in an actual head to head race where they're going to toe to week and week out? No, because they are vulnerable defensively, and it will always, in my opinion, catch them out. 
It is interesting seeing this kind of bleed over into fan culture because I don't know if we want to discuss the uh, the whole you copy does with everything type thing. <laughs> it is interesting. There feels like a sort of a a struggle, a power, bit of a power struggle going on between you know City are are the dominant force in English football. No one's, no one's denying that right now. But who's second? And that is you know that is going to be the debate certainly as Klopp's leaving. Um, you know that I think there's been an answer. But you know now, as we move forward, there is certainly going to be a conversation about that, and I, I think it will be us. And I think Liverpool are getting status anxiety. You know, they're going, you know, we invented fist bumps, we invented smiling, we invented first team contracts, we invented songs, we invented everything. But shouldn't that make sense, I, mate? I, we, we, because like... We, 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 jo- we, we joke about it, but I think there is a there is a, a status anxiety in, and George, I think what you're going to say is, is it makes sense? Well, it makes sense because you look at, they're defending Klopp before it happens. They know he's going. Like, here, let me put a scenario to you. Look, obviously, hopeful Arsenal fan shock. We win the league. What does that mean for Klopp in terms of his Premier yeah. League legacy? Yeah. The so-called, like, yeah. The, yeah. the Pep's Komen inside four years achieved what has taken Klopp how many years? Who has been lauded mm-hmm. as one of the best. When we do these top managers of all time, he's up there, right? And he's up there for what he's done. How, how does that... He's in the Shankly-Paisley conversation for Liverpool. Abs- you know, so absolutely. That so that, and, then, and then you know what I think it does, too? It actually, it's not just a status update for Klopp, but it's almost a status update for Liverpool as a football club. There are there are Liverpool fans that I talk with that talk about Klopp as one of their greatest ever managers. And they genuinely believe that there's an argument for that. There's, you know, Dalglish, Stankly, you know, you, you mentioned there's a couple in those top three, but he's in there. Did you call him Stankly? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's the new slander name. <laughs> Shankly. <laughs> Bill Stankly. Bill Stankly. Um but that's going that's going to be it's it's a it's just so Canadian, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is a um it is it is going to be a status problem for them. It's going to be a status problem. And so I think that that's that's really the underlying fear with all of it. And and I think that the underlying fear I mean, from I, an Arsenal perspective is trying to say, like, look, we never left. We've left for 20 years. And there's a and there's a push for us to gain relevancy again. And so th- that's why there's more animosity, in my opinion, between Liverpool and Arsenal, broadly speaking. Like, ironically, you would look at the mm. City and Liverpool dynamic, and I think it's getting there. Like, th- we have had touchy encounters with the players, and I don't think that Pep and Arteta become best of friends when um, stuff actually happens in terms of winning titles, and there actually is a threat. I think there will become an animosity, but there's one right now that's been brewing for quite a while, and it's gotten worse because... Not just the scuffle on the sideline that Mikel has done in our actual games, but just our fan bases in general. We're both vying to be that we are the club that was reborn and we did it better than you. We did it more sustainably than you. We didn't do it without the injection of cash. And by the way, ooh, we also have more academy grads that are playing and we're doing it in the right way better than you. That's, I think, the title that both clubs are fighting for in a certain extent. And that's contributing to this almost this this more visceral response to whenever Arsenal or Liverpool fans talk about each other as a club. I personally, I don't know if I'm wrong. I have more animosity towards Liverpool than I do Manchester City. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And also, uh, you know, I do find it funny because, and I'm genuinely not trying to point score here. This is this is just facts. People say the Pep and Klopp era. And I'm like, what do you mean the guy who won five titles yeah. and the one and the guy who won one title? Like, it, it's really, it's it is really bizarre. And I get he pushed him close. I 100 percent get that. But that's like saying, you know, the the Wenger Ferguson and Martin like O'Neill, well, the Benitez Ferguson era. Yeah, the Benitez. Benitez. The like, yeah, okay, but you know, we, you're simultaneously saying you can't say anything about this Arsenal team because you don't go over the line, and also saying you never get over the line apart from once, but you're in the Klopp, Klopp and Pep era, so you can't have it both ways. So I, I, I do find it bizarre because you know history is written by the winners, and I think you're right, George, that you know when we look back on this era of the Pep and Klopp stuff, what does it mean if Arteta wins wins a title in that era before presumably going on to win more? What does that mean for Klopp's legacy? What does that mean? And here we go. Here's a question. Because I thought about this the other day. If Arteta wins a Premier League this season, okay, and we've already said that in the top 10 Premier League managers of all time, there are Premier League managers with one Mm -hmm. Premier League. Because he's won it in the Klopp and Pep era, if Arteta wins it this year, is he in the top 10 Premier League managers of all time? Do you know he'd also be the youngest to ever win it? I'm just saying. Yep. 
But logic by by everyone's own logic, if you're listening to this now and you have a top ten Premier League managers in, in, of all time in your head, there will be some on that list like Mancini, maybe like Pellegrini, like maybe like Ranieri, or maybe that's a different achievement. Whatever there'll be uh, uh, Mate, Ancelotti, Klopp, what what <laughs> Klopp exactly Klopp, right? Just, your, uh, by I your think, own logic, yeah. they've only got one Premier League title. It's, so is our why I bring it up, mate. Well. I think it's beyond just this anxiety over Klopp. It starts getting into, holy crap, we're talking about all-time managers here. We're talking about the status yeah. for all-time. And, you know, you look at... And by the way, Mikel did it with a team that didn't have three of the Premier League's all-time positions in their in their squad, arguably. People make a case, and there could be more, when all is said and done, Georgie, baby. Look, baby, when all is said is done, of course. But in the <laughs> moment, you could argue Allison, Salah, Virgil van Dijk are without a doubt yep. right now. Trent. 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 Trent as well. Arguably is in the Premier League all time. And for me, he yep. is. But I know that's a debate for people. But I, I think three, those three are not debated. Like Virgil van Dijk is talked about as one of the best center backs the Premier League has ever seen. Mohamed Salah is one of the best right wingers the Premier League has ever seen. Allison, as a goalkeeper, is one of the best goalkeepers the Premier League has ever seen. Undoubted. You know, Trent, I think we project a bit because we all believe he's... And he only won one Premier League title. Oh. I'm not saying it. I'm just putting the facts. Careful, careful, careful. I'm just bringing it up. <laughs> I'm asking the questions. <laughs> the Canadian just Frank, asked Arguably four in a <laughs> Arguably four in a Premier League you know, 11 and you know one more, title. Oh. What's more exciting to me is not Ooh. the fact that we can burst... Burst Brother, yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It's, that's a, that's that's an exciting thing to talk about, of course. But for me, what's more exciting is if we do win a title in the Pep and Klopp era, and Mikel becomes the youngest manager to ever win so. Pep's gonna leave in the next two three years, anyways. Klopp's going as it is. Well, what position there. does that? What position does that put Mikel Arteta then to go in and further? Because, I mean, that's a very if you can get over the line in the Pep and Klopp era. Um, who's next after that? Who's going to come to the Premier League? Who's going to replace Pep Guardiola at Man City or Liverpool? Uh, it's going to be... And, it's gonna, and that puts Mikel Arteta in this massive mental victory. The narrative must be his childhood best friend coming from Germany to yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah. do it. And yeah. you're going to be looking at... Areola, him. he's already at Bournemouth, but, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what I will say is the the reason... Yes, Pep and Klopp are... are but they are, jokes aside, terrific managers. The... The thing is, as well, is the organization had been aligned under them. Pep and City is completely aligned. Klopp and Liverpool completely aligned. Arteta and Arsenal almost completely aligned, I would say now, is maybe completely aligned. Is there a guarantee that even if you get, if there was a Pep regen who came to, to the Premier League, is there a guarantee that there is going to be that alignment of head coach, of manager, of sporting director? Are you going to get that alchemy right straight away after Pep and Klopp leave? You, you know the, is that, you know the is irony, that happen? mate? I stack Liverpool as the easiest club to do that with because of what they just did. They got Michael Edwards, the best sporting director, who's now their CEO. He's doing a lot more than just that. Um, who's back at the club leading decisions. You've got Chappie Alonso that, make no mistake about it, we joke, he is one of the best upcoming managerial prospects in the world. There's no doubt about that. To do what he's doing with Leverkusen and is, you know, is unprecedented, really. So he, he's got that ability. And, um, so, so that alignment that you talk about, mate, like that's the potential I see. I look at City and I do wonder for all the brilliance of the club and all the impending uncertainty off the pitch in terms of those charges. That's a difficult club to transition when Pep, Pep goes. He's so ingrained in who they are. Like the reason Pep, like Manchester City are revel, relevant is Pep. It's not so much the players. Like I, you look at City. And they prepared for him as well. Absolutely. They prepared for him. Absolutely. So that's a more difficult transition. That's actually maybe a more fun transition to see who do we debate coming in. And you can't just say names like Robert Zerbe. I, I really struggle to see somebody with the – there is no aura. Honestly, there isn't. He, he's arguably the best manager to have ever managed. Him leaving is going to be a downgrade. There, it's impossible. Um, whereas I would argue, if Mikel so if Mikel wins so the title, there is an opportunity to say that Klopp could he be somebody that we can replicate in another way? Yeah, I don't know. Look, we have to do it first, and let's just say our fixtures are not going to help us. <laughs> they are very difficult. City away, and cue the Doomer. We were talking Brighton away. Now, now the Doomer. Right? Yeah. 
Classic. Yeah, Brighton oh. I, I had to, and I bet he, I bet he thinks we won't win against Bayern as well. I bet he doesn't <laughs> no, think listen, we'll win. Listen, listen. Okay, so it's Brighton away, <laughs> Bayern at home, Villa at home, Bayern away, and then of course after that you got potentially Chelsea, Spurs that is away. Cr- that is crazy. And if we get to the semi-finals and you got maybe City or Real, and then you got United away, Everton and Wolves away, difficult, difficult. So welcome to the top, lads. Welcome to the top. These are the not easy. These are the privileges. So looking at the, the, those fixtures there, like I, I'm really scared because those fixtures are difficult. Not even just the United away and Spurs away, but like the little tricky ones. And I'm like, for us to go, because some fans honestly believe we have to go unbeaten to win a title at the end of the season or at least win every single game. I don't think it's going to happen like that. Me and Alex went through the fixtures last in the last podcast and we, we kind of found out that we, you know, we've got quite a few winnable games there, but there will be a slip in my opinion. You know, there always is one. So the question is, do you guys believe that that title is possible looking at the fixtures. We'll go to Alex first because I expect a positive answer. And if I don't get a positive answer, <laughs> we can kick out of the on. chat right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just me and George going at it really, isn't it? Uh, look, I... I I'm going to hold you to your word said... about previous podcasts about how a positive result at Manchester City has the potential to change your mind. That's all I'm going to preface that with. Mate, if we if we get a positive, I will say this: if we draw at Man City, I'm 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 not like sold, but I'm getting towards sold. But if we win, I'm sold, hundred percent. We guys, we got him. I just don't think <laughs> <laughs> we got him, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We got him. Um, I I just I've always maintained, and sorry to be that guy, but I have always maintained. I think we'll fall short. But by the way, falling short in this era, as we've discussed, is it still an incredible, incredible result? I think we will come second to another ridiculous Man City team that will probably win the Champions League. And that's okay. Like, it's okay. I think, as you said, Babs, I think we're, we'll probably have a slip-up or two. I actually, honestly, if I had to predict the Man City game right now, I think we'll look really good and, and, and might not quite get over the line. Um, but I don't... What I don't... What I don't predict... Let's, let's say this. I predict us to fall short, but what I don't predict is a fall-off. I really can't see that happening. I can't see Arsenal for a second season successively of football just absolutely falling apart. I don't think we'll get over the line, but I think we'll look really good. And I think the challenge of analysis now will be, no, no, guys, we're still at that level, but getting over the line is the very last thing in the process. I have a whole thing. <laughs> I made this, really. Oh, God. I made this God, for perhaps. a... Um, for this is something I prepared earlier. I was talking about this on a, on, a, on another show that I won't reference. Um which you can see if, you, if you're on YouTube and subscribe to us. So you can see this is the line, getting over the line. Can you see that? Okay. So, yes, we can see it. I'm going to get my mic a little closer. So the line is here. This is a right? meme. <laughs> that is a line. Yes. <laughs> it's an automatic we, we meme. The line is here, right? This is the title, okay? If okay. we finish there, we get the same result as someone who finishes here. You with me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the analysis is, well, you've all done the same thing. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, you haven't. You just haven't got that little bit. I think we last season, we were here and then we fell back. And I think we're going to get to here and not quite get over it. But that is okay. It's still progress. I think we'll get more points and we'll have the great experience in the Champions League. And that's okay. All of our beautiful, uh, <laughs> you know, YouTube members and patron members and even new, hopefully, members. Just that have everyone can see it. Click everyone off can Patreon see this, George. Now. Everyone can see yeah, this. They, they go, we're not subscribed to Patreon it's anymore. It's a Monday They're show. Like, if this is the quality they get. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> and it was just the newly, <laughs> hopefully, subscribe members, I hope you guys see that this is the type of content you receive. This <laughs> this is that you'll watch the retention just it was like going along shooting right, up mate no no it's going to shoot up it's going to shoot up <laughs> um look i um i'm not going to surprise i'm optimistic i have been all season yeah. i've started from the start i don't i don't shy away from it and in in the words of Mikel, hit me you know i i think that it's exciting from, from a number yes. perspective i will say this I don't I don't worry about bigger games with Arsenal. Genuinely. I really don't. Arsenal have the best record against the top six clubs this season in the Premier League. I think that Arsenal in general, when I've looked at the times that we have fallen, guys, last season, what was the what was the issue? West Ham, Southampton. The, I look at this season, Fulham twice. Guys, we lost to Fulham. We dropped four points to Fulham this season. This Fulham side. It like 
for me, those are the type of teams that I fear, ironically. So as the schedule and the congestion gets yeah. more difficult, I start to say, okay, well, at the very least, I know the boys are up for it. I've worried this season when the boys haven't been up for it and they've been against teams that are proverbially worse than us. So I, I, I'm confident I am taking it game by game. And I think that the big one is you start with a win against mm-hmm. City and that does serious things to the squad. We'll, we'll see what happens against City. I'm also looking forward to April, April, May, because um, our rivals in North London will have a say in the title as well. They will. Because they play City, Arsenal and Liverpool back to back to back. So, and obviously City and Arsenal, uh, we both play them away. And then obviously they got to go to Anfield as well, which they don't have a great record at. Things are getting interesting and exciting. So I, look, this is the conversations that I wanted to be a part of Off years and years ago. Off and defense, and listen, I, I, I feel like, I feel like we're going to do it. So that's, that's, could, see, I've actually what, given a definite answer. What not, are you not, both, uh, could, could, uh, can I have a prediction? Come, I think we're going out against Bayern. I think we're coming second. Babs, George? Semis. I think we go out in the semis, I think, and I think yeah, that I we, think we'll uh, be Bayern. And I do think that we do the league. Yeah, I think I think we'll beat Bayern, mm-hmm. but we will lose in the semis. And I think the way we beat Bayern is the first leg will kind of stick in it, and then the second leg will find a way to shop people and get like a little scrappy win at the Alliance. And then the Premier League, I reckon, I reckon because actually now saying now George has put it out as well, I think the big games actually come in our favour in a sense where we actually perform better in big games, and I think the players will be up for it more often, less time to slack, and I think. Uh, look, a win against City, and and I think a lot of the conversation and the narratives change around Arsenal. So we'll see. So that, anyways, well, that, guys, that wasn't a definite answer. <laughs> no, I said I said we win the league title. We'll get to the semis. Win the league title. You know what I mean, yeah, okay. clear, loud. Check one more time. Win the league no, title. No, we'll get to the semis. That. Comments. Let us know where do you think Arsenal will end this season. Do not sit on the fence like Alexander Moneypenny, <laughs> and let us know exactly where Arsenal are going to finish. Anyways, guys, that is. The first full YouTube pod there and there. And Spotify so and Apple. Guys, Go check us out on Spotify and, and Apple Spotify as well. And Spotify and Apple. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed. And if you have, of course, we've got another pod coming out on Patreon on Thursday alongside another YouTube, YouTube member- video as well. You guys, leaving out the I, YouTube I, I, I members. I was about to say the YouTube members. You cut me off, mate. Horrendous. You know what I mean? Calma, calma. You see, you see the, and YouTube so members. this is... It, this is the patron members this is the and this is, no, this is the, this is yeah. the YouTube yeah, yeah, members yeah, yeah. and we're missing all of these guys. <laughs> yeah. All right, lads, it's been an hour. Take care. Peace. Peace. <laughs> We've had Babs this time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take it. <laughs>